the Holy Gospel for the second Sunday after Epiphany is recorded in the Gospel of John, chapter 2. I invite you to rise for its reading, please. On the third day, there was a wedding in Cana of Galilee, and the mother of Jesus was there. And Jesus and his disciples had also been invited to the wedding. When the wine gave out, the mother of Jesus said to him, They have no wine. And Jesus said to her, Woman, what concern is that to you and to me? My hour has not yet come. His mother said to his servant, to the servants, Do whatever he tells you. Now standing there were six stone water jars for the Jewish rites of purification, each holding twenty or thirty gallons. Jesus said to them, Fill the jars with water, and they filled them up to the brim. He said to them, Now draw some out and take it to the chief steward. So they took it. When the steward tasted the water that had become wine and did not know where it came from, but the servants who had drawn the water knew, the steward called the bridegroom and said to him, Everyone serves the good wine first, and then the inferior wine after the guests have become drunk. But you have kept the good wine until now. Jesus did this, the first of his signs in Canaan of Galilee, and revealed his glory. And his disciples believed him. The gospel of the Lord. Thanks be to God. I invite my children, friends, you may be seated. Children. Well, I wonder how many times in the past week I heard the message or one very similar to it. When I win that $1.5 billion lottery, this church is going to build its anticipated classrooms and new kitchen and even a very fine, fine music room. I smile. I smile because we have not dug a hole for the footings yet. And it's not because of the frost. Yes, friends, I do admit that I've known to pay for a ticket at the state fair to spin the wheel to win a teddy bear. Yes, I have been known to buy a ticket for a meat raffle with the help of my wife. Yes, she's wondering when I did that. And I was with some friends one night when we all bought pull tabs, and I found out there's a real ritual about opening pull tabs that I didn't have a clue how it went. The lottery. What a snapshot of our culture. The lottery represents the way in which that we launch something that we don't have now and we're willing to throw money out with a very, very slim chance that I may somehow get a cash cow. If you can't see through the lines, folks, I do have some serious issues with our lottery culture. Now, if a person is willing to throw a, a limited amount of money out the window and make it fun, that is one thing. But I see that there are some people entering the lottery with the mentality that I'm going to get something big and I'm going to get out of my debts in ways in which that I cannot get out of it by working for the money. And I think for those who can't afford that, there's some moral implications. I am conflicted with the lottery because I see it regressive. Those of us who have discretionary money can throw it away one way or another. It doesn't make any difference. But for the people that are poor, the people that are struggling, and see that as the way in which that, that's out of poverty, that we need to be considerate of them in the way in which that currently we probably don't even think about. Do you want to really watch me squirm someday? Present the church a check with $2 million for a building project that you won in the lottery and watch me in my moral dilemma at that time. The reading of Psalm 36 this morning gives a counterpoint to the lottery mentality. Because in Psalm 36, we're reminded of something that's an absolute certain bet. It's God's amazing love. The psalmist says, Your love reaches to the heavens and your faithfulness to the clouds. How priceless is your love, O Lord! All people take refuge under the shadow of your wings. They feast upon the abundance of your house. You give them drink from the river of delight. 
You see, what the psalmist is saying here is that he didn't want to leave any hesitation or doubt. Does God love us or love me or not? Absolutely he does. This is the love of a God that comes that says, no matter if you made mistakes, I'm going to still love you. The love of a God that comes and says that even though we are apt to stray away from his embrace and turn our eyes to other things other than God, he says, I'm going to still love you. The God who comes and says to us that even though we act as if God does not exist and we can't find a strength that only God can give, God says, I still love you. What our God wants to whisper in our ears over and over again is what we hear from Isaiah 43. I have called you by name. You are mine. When you are honored and you are precious in my sight, and I love you. You see, this is what the psalmist wants us to walk away with in worship life and every time we open the scriptures, that we are reminded that we have a God who will never, ever stop loving us. No matter how unworthy we may feel, this love will keep coming. Francis Schaeffer wrote a book some years ago entitled, How Then Shall We Live? And I think both of the scripture lessons that we read this morning are really beckoning us to answer that question on the basis of the love of a God that comes to us. How then are we to live? Right now, folks, two young families of our congregation are going through challenging times. I mentioned David and Angela Myers and their family that lost their entire home and their possessions. I honestly cannot even comprehend what that must be like for them to start all over with all of those precious memories and pictures and school assignments and things that were undone in the home. You see, when those things happen that we don't understand, it would be only natural for us to ask questions, God, where are you in these times? When the injustice of suffering comes, we all have had those questions asked, and there's nothing wrong with them because that's a natural response to things we don't understand that come as a form of injustice. You see, friends, the question we need to ask ourselves, how then shall we live, has some implications on how we surround the Myers family. Because the reality is when we cannot sometimes see God's love with our own eye and heart, Sometimes the love of God takes on the appearance of members of our Savior's Lutheran Church who sit in the pews like you and me. You see, what I'm saying is that when the family is struggling, maybe the way in which that God's love can be visible in a very clear way to the Myers family is that when we rally around them the best we can and say that you are not going to be struggling alone because as this Christian community, we're going to not only walk with you, but support you in your best way as your new beginning comes. You see, God's love takes on human flesh when we enter into the story. And maybe that's how God's love is visible. And maybe that's how we answer the question, how then shall we live? But we have another young couple in our congregation that are going through a challenging time. Kevin and Liz Landwehr are discovered that their unborn child has spina bifida. And even as we worship in the coming hours and days, they're contemplating going out to California where there's a doctor who knows how to do surgery on children that can come out of the fetus and correct that open part of the spine for spina bifida patients, put them back into the fetus and the mother stays until birth. Impossible to comprehend. So as we worship here, Liz and Kevin are pondering what this doctor can say about their possibility and their their love for this unborn child. Once again, as a congregation, we have an opportunity to put on the flesh of God's love It's for the family that says we are not going to let you go to California without you knowing that we're going to love you and support you. And as Grandma Sandy and as Grandpa Dave give care to little Hunter that stays back here when the parents go to California, that we will never, ever let you remember, forget that we are going to walk alongside of you, Sandy and Dave, and care for you each step of the way. You see, when the times get tough and we can't clearly see God's face and hear his promise of his presence, sometimes it comes to you and me. You see, we do need the Christian community. That's how God has created us to live. Then we turn to the gospel. Jesus is at this wedding and we remember that the wine ran low. 
And his mother told Jesus to do something about this. And we have, could go into a long conversation about what that means. But Jesus told the servants to fill up all six of these jars that were meant for purification. Filled them with water. 120 to 180 gallons of water. And it all turned into wine. Friends, this fine wine was not about a beverage that was going to be consumed at a wedding reception. It's about a God who is saying, I'm coming into this world and I'm doing something great, far greater than you could ever, ever imagine. You see, that's what Jesus wants to do when he comes into our lives, is convincing us that he is going to do something far greater than what we could ever think that this loving God can do in our lives. This is not a miracle of turning water into wine. It's a miracle of the way in which that God breaks into this world in Jesus and convinces us that our lives are different going forward because he is in our lives. So this scripture and the first one are begging the same question. How then shall we live? The staff of this church, all of us, are taking upon ourselves a challenge and there are two goals among the other goals that we're going to be having. And the two goals are that we're going to grow in our worship of this loving God. We're going to grow in every way we can to let our heart be softened by this love so that our lives are a reflection of the worship that we want to give this God. Why do we do that? Do you remember the story of Moses coming down the mountain with a tablet of stone? When he came down with the Ten Commandments the first time around, what did he discover? that they were worshiping a golden calf. You see, the temptation that we all have is to create golden calves in some way or another, and it's this many times it happens without our even thinking about it, that we find our lives focused to be something other than the, the grace of God and the love of Jesus, and it becomes centered in something else. And it simply happens so quietly sometimes, and we need to be called back. And that's why, as a staff, we're saying we're going to try to eliminate everything that would want to take first place in our life and only worship Christ as the one who has claim in my life. The second goal that we're going to ask ourselves is how can we grow in our stewardship? If for some of us, it might mean a dollar and cents issue. But for some of the rest of us, it might be how we use our time. It might be the way in which that we're more careful about how we recycle and we're careful about the resources that God has given to us. But both goals, one of growing in worship, growing in stewardship, is in reflection and response to the love of God that we know in the scriptures, and in Jesus, the one who says, I'm going to do something far greater with you than you could ever imagine. We're calling this living intentionally. Will you join us? I lovingly challenge every member of this church to pick up the, the mantle of two goals. One is growing in your worship life. It might be a matter of making Sunday morning or Wednesday night a priority. It might be picking up the scriptures and making devotions more of an important part of our everyday life. It might be that we covenant to ourselves, we're going to pray for our worship life, no matter where we are in our world, working or out of state, that we're going to pray for worship here at our Savior so that God's Spirit would speak to every one of us who gather here. Will you be willing to set some goal regarding worship, to set the love of God and the knowledge of knowing Jesus as the center of your life? And secondly, to ask yourself how you can grow in stewardship, to look at your life and see the gifts that you've been given and maybe even go home to your house and say, Lord, I never thank you for my house before until I hear of a family from church whose house was completely destroyed. And ask yourself, how can we use all that we have been given for the glory of God, that's stewardship. So how then are we to live? This is really part of the issue that we're going to be looking at as a part of our series in February, What on Earth Am I Here For? And if you want to explore together with other Christians from church, that might be an opportunity for you to sign up in a small group. But you see, living intentionally is in stark contrast with Powerball thinking. Powerball thinking is hoping to win something really at somebody else's expense. But living intentionally is living from the certainty of a love of a God and in Jesus Christ is doing something in my life in this world that I want to be a part of it. So then how then shall we live? 
This week, some of you may, as you have in the past, go out and buy another lottery ticket. Blessings on you. But as you do, and as you stand in line behind others who buy their lottery ticket, I invite us all to think about the fact that this is a game of chance and choice. But when we invest ourselves in God's love, there's no doubt about it. Absolutely no hint of question that God's embrace will hold us tight and will never, ever let us go. And in Jesus, God is doing something in my life that's the far greater than I could ever think possible. That is what living with intention is all about. And that is slam dunk, sure bet. Amen.